Welcome to the Green Wasp Removal YouTube channel. In this episode, we're going to show you part two of a two-part episode we began back on November 16th when we uploaded part one of this video. If you haven't seen part one yet, we recommend you start there and check it out whenever you can. Here in part two, we have a two-hour special to show you the inside of five different bald-faced hornet nests. These were all nests that were pulled from the wild in the first two weeks of November. Many of them were as high as 30 feet off the ground. Some of them were a little bit lower. So what we know is these were not treated or sprayed. They were able to reach full maturity or they were stopped somehow in that process naturally through animal activity or weather or parasitic activity, which is what we'll show you in this video where parasitoid wasps moved into some of the cells of the bald-faced hornets, ate their larva, ate their pupa, and develop their own cocoons and larvae inside the bald-faced hornet cells. We'll show you other insects that were found inside some of these nests and why they are there. And we'll explore the beautiful paper material that these wasps can create. Bald-faced hornets make some of the prettiest nests that we work with. They look like gorgeous Chinese lanterns and piñatas. It's always such a pleasure to appreciate nature's art. Welcome back from the Thanksgiving break. I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, today is part two of a video we started before about bald-faced hornet nests. We're going to do a forensic analysis on several nests today. We'll try to get through these pretty quick because it might rain on us later on, so we're going to speed this through a little bit. But this is part two, so if you want to see part one of another nest that was forensically examined, uh, just take a look at our other videos. You'll find that, and we hope you enjoy and learn something from this. Have fun. Okay, for starters, let's take a look at what we're going to see today. Uh, we're going to have these three large nests that we look at. We're also going to look at two smaller nests that never reached full maturity, it looks like, from the size of them. We're going to go through each one of these, find out what's inside them. Uh, we're going to take a look at the number of combs in these nests. We're going to take a look at the cells of the, each nest. Inside each comb, we're going to pull some samples out of each cell. We want to take a look at which organisms are still inside these cells that did not hatch out, uh, such as these. You'll see some that were pupating but didn't hatch out. We'll try to open up all the cells on each one of these nests to take a look at uh, what's inside. Sometimes there's live wasps, sometimes there's dead wasps, sometimes there are other organisms, parasites and so forth, that have invaded the nest. So we'll take a look and see. The tools we use for this are important to know about um, just for a, from a safety standpoint, you never want to reach into a nest like this without some type of protection because there can be live insects in there. Everything from spiders to live wasps to other sorts of insects that can bite you. There's also pathogens, possibly transferable ones here. Anything from rodent droppings and activity to bird droppings and so forth that all carry pathogens you don't want on your skin or transferring into your eyes, you rub your eye, whatever. Just wear gloves, okay, and bring tools for the job. We measure things with the measuring tape so we can document the size of these nests. We use scissors to cut through the paper. We use long tongs and we use smaller tweezers. We use a jar to collect these specimens from the nest, anything that's alive or deceased, uh, as far as wasps and other insects. Finally, there's a phone brick. This is just a power brick, so if the phone loses charge in the middle of the field out here in the field lab, we always carry an extra brick. It's highly recommended you do that anywhere you are in the field. These bricks are cheap. Uh, you can get them just for a few bucks these days, and man, they will extend the life of your phone well beyond a typical charge uh, for hours. So you should take them wherever you go. We also have these extra bins, and these are just for storing the paper from each nest. If you want to separate them all to document each one separately, and some bins to hold the combs from each nest. These are just handy uh, for archival purposes. All right, so let's get started. We'll start with the biggest one today. All right, let's take a look at a measurement on this first nest. Looks like lengthwise it's about 11 inches. And the width on this nest looks like the widest point. It's 
about 10 inches. So let's say this one's maybe 10 by 11, give or take. This is a nicely matured nest. As you look at this nest, it was suspended from this branch in a tree. About 30 feet off the ground is where it was found. It reached full maturity. It's got a beautiful paper. You can see greens and dark browns and tans and grays and almost white. It's a beautiful paper throughout most of it. Beautiful colors throughout the whole nest. Really pretty. That may be my favorite thing about all these nests is the colors on them. If you look at the opening on the nest, You can see the central opening, which is usually hanging like this. It's on the bottom of the nest, typically somewhere near the bottom. And if you look inside, it's a little hard to get in there with light, so we'll have to open it up and take a look at what we see. So let's start by cutting it right up the middle to remove the paper. paper on this nest. Very, very thick layers of paper. And here we can expose all the comb. You can see all the branches built right through the comb structures to help support the nest. They just build the nest around all this branch. This is the top of the nest. It would hang in the wild like this. This would be the top. The combs face the bottom of the nest. A lot of wind today so I apologize if some of the audio is having difficulty with that we're gonna take the paper and examine it later first we're gonna do the comb so we're gonna put this inside one of the bins for now let's take a look at the paper on the comb there's an interesting layer of paper As you see inside, you can start to see the structure of what keeps the combs together and connected. That inner structure is very tough material and it's made from wood fiber and the saliva of the wasp and the fluids from the wasp that makes kind of a paste like paper mache. 
and this entire nest is built out of that material with the exception of the silk caps. The silk caps are actually woven by the larva inside each cell and the larva put the cap over their cell while they pupate and turn into adult wasps and when they're done pupating they chew right out of these cells right out of the silk cap and they emerge as adult wasps. But the rest of this nest, all the comb, all the paper, everything that holds the nest to the wood of the tree is all done through wood fiber collected out there and foraged by the wasp and brought back in small loads and then built over time. As you remove all the paper from the wood here, you can really begin to see the back of the comb structure. It's very tough cardboard-like material because it's all wood fiber. It's probably the toughest part of the nest is the back of the combs. And there's a lot of leaf material in here mixed right in with the nest. So you have these support structures in the sticks of the twig, but you also have leaves built right in as part of the paper of the nest. And the reason we wear these gloves, these are triple strength industrial rubber gloves. The purpose for these is absolutely to protect your hands from both pathogens if there's any type of uh, transferable pathogens in these nests from animals, birds, rodents, even wasps. But basically you don't want to reach into any part of a nest without some type of protection on your hands. Uh, also it protects you from bites and stings if there's spiders or other insects in there already. And that is often the case with these nests that have reached peak season. As you get down to the main structure, you'll see basically there's one very strong connection that was the beginning of this nest right in here. And the queen that built this nest would have started this back in the springtime on a single small twig right here. And she would have built and built and built until she had a small golf ball sized nest that just grew and grew and grew from there into this giant comb, which is the first comb on the nest. And all of her workers, her female workers who are not reproductives typically, would be born first. And then when they're born, they help her build out the rest of this huge comb where all of the others will be born. Then the secondary combs typically are larger. If you compare the sizes of these little cells on the first comb, the cells on the second comb. These are usually going to be reproductives or males or queens born in the larger cells of the secondary comb structures. Sometimes you'll see males in these other cells, uh, but usually the, the bigger queen type wasps are going to be in these later comb structures. So for now, it appears that most of these were hatched out. So this nest was pretty successful in the wild. There's a few like these you can see that started pupation but never finished the process. So the adult wasp never had time to chew its way out. Uh, for some reason, these are the same. You can see these are slightly smaller. These are worker cells down here and they're pretty small. 
you compare those to the larger ones up on top, which are reproductive cells, maybe queens or males, you can tell the difference in size just by looking at them. So we'll go into these cells now and take a look at what is going on inside each cell that did not pupate out properly. And typically what you're going to see in here is that some may have died due to cold weather. They just didn't have time to finish pupation before cold weather killed everything in the nest. So it may have been cold weather that killed some of the pupating cells, or it may have been disease or parasite activity. A lot of times what you'll find is that there are other species of wasps that will target bald-faced hornet nests and they will act as parasites on these nests. In other words, they will use an ovipositor, which is an egg delivery system basically, and they will poke their ovipositor right through the cell cap and lay an egg onto the developing bald-faced hornet larva. And when they do this, that egg will eventually hatch and the bald-faced hornet larva become the food for that developing egg. And that other wasp egg will turn into a larva that will start to eat the pupating wasp inside this cell. That often happens. So a lot of these you will see not only a pupating bald-faced hornet, but you'll also find a parasite eating that hornet or activity that suggests a parasite already got in and ate it and then left. They can get in by chewing into the bottom of the cell. They can get in by going through the top, opening it up. And what you'll find is another cocoon right inside the bald-faced hornet cell. So you'll find the remains of the eaten bald-faced hornet larva or pupating wasp. And you'll also find in that same cell a new cocoon from the parasitic wasp that came in. And there's several parasitic wasps that may do this. Um, and we can talk about that. You can see an actual parasitic wasp that we found inside one of these cells that was alive and feeding on a pupating wasp in our other video, part one of this same two-part series on these bald-faced nest forensic analysis. But you can look at that other video and actually see one of those parasitic wasps. So now let's take a look at what's inside these cells. To begin with, we'll do the top comb and we'll just take a look and see if we can find any remains of the original pupating wasp inside. Here's a pupating wasp that was parasitized. So you'll find that the wasp lived long enough, the pupating wasp lived long enough to spin its silk cap and get pretty well developed as a pupa. But then something got inside, which is a parasitic wasp most likely, and began to eat this wasp from the bottom up. And if you look down inside the cell, if you look down in there, you can actually see the cocoon of the parasitic wasp. So typically a cell like this would be empty. If it came out normally, it would be empty like this one here. The dark one you see, it's just an empty cell that was used by a, a typical bald-faced hornet that pupated out as an adult. But if you look at this one, that will show you what a parasitic cell looks like. If this is a cell that was invaded by a parasitic wasp and that wasp made its own cocoon inside the cell of this bald-faced hornet cell. So you're gonna see dual cocoons. It looks like these have hatched out. Whatever parasitic wasp was inside here have already hatched out of the secondary cocoon inside there. You can tell that because it's open. It's been chewed out of that extra cocoon. And so whatever was alive in there has come out. Let's take a look in there and see if we can get a little bit better look at it. So 
So that I don't see anything left in this cell. So it looks like everything that was in there hatched out, the parasite that was in there, the parasitic wasp that was in there hatched out. Now, in the cell next door, down at the bottom of that one, there's a little cocoon-like structure still that may not have been hatched out of yet. Not sure if the camera can pick that up or not. But we're gonna try to break open that cell, that extra cocoon, and see if there's anything in there like a larva of a parasitic wasp. So if you look at this, here's what the cocoon of the parasitic wasp looks like. It's down inside the bottom of the other cell. And it's a hard little shell. Feels kind of like a nut. It's hard. And inside this is typically the larva of the parasitic wasp that invaded the cell of the bald-faced hornet. So let's try to break this open and we'll see if we can get inside to take a look. Maybe there's an occupant in there, maybe there isn't at this point. Okay. So inside here, we actually find three separate larval cells. There's actually three separate cells with developing parasites in them. And each one of these may have a parasite inside it. This looks like the remains of a pupa or an egg of some type. If you look at the other two, it's the same thing here. Inside, there is some type of what looks like larval egg or pupa that was in here. And this is the remains of the parasitic larva that was inside the bald-faced hornet cells. That's the second one. Now in the third one, you see the same thing. Inside that little structure is a pupating parasite that we interrupted pulled out. So this is an egg or a larva of a parasitic insect that was inside the bald-faced hornet. So in the cell of the bald-faced hornet, you had three of these that were alien visitors to this nest that were parasitic in nature and fed on the pupating wasp inside. Let's see what the next one looks like. Here we have the same thing. With this one, you see the same problem. This one was parasitized as well. You can see how it was eaten by a parasitic wasp. This larva that was pupating was able to make its silk cap, but during that process, a parasite oviposited an egg into there which then began to eat this pupa alive until it was killed. And in that process, it was able to allow its own larva, the parasite, to survive out of this cell. So inside this cell, there's cocoon-like structures of the parasitic wasps that did this to the bald-faced hornet.
Now, if we pull out the structure inside, again you have a couple little seed-like structures that are the cocoons of the parasitic wasp. Now some of these parasites take a couple of years to develop. So they'll stay inside an old wasp nest for a couple of years before they actually come out. Depends on the species of wasp and the time of year that they were initially deposited the eggs. So it looks like we'll probably see the same with this one. All right, so in here, you can see pretty clearly the remains of the original occupant, which was the pupating wasp. And on that pupating wasp, you have the larva right here. These are ectoparasites that were feeding on this larva. And these are the ectoparasites that are parasitic wasps. And this little larva is a separate species of wasp, an egg that was laid right through the silk cap onto the body of the pupating bald-faced hornet. And this began to eat the bald-faced hornet during its own development. Eventually, it would come out as an adult parasitic wasp. And if you want to see what that looks like, you can check out one of our other videos, part one of this series of bald-faced hornet forensic analysis stuff. And you can see one of those parasitic wasps, see what they look like. Because we found one inside one of the cells, an adult that was just about ready to come out. So that's what you have here. Here we've put onto this leaf the parasitic wasp larva. You can see the eyes developing already in the parasitic larva. Uh, you can see some of the antenna has already developed on this wasp, on the larva. This is a very long antenna, which is indicative of a particular type of species of parasitic wasp. And we crushed the body of it a little bit when it was pulled out of the cell. But basically, it's pretty obvious that this larva was alive and developing inside that cell. And that's what comes out of these parasitic relationships with these bald-faced hornet nests. These wasps have a chance to survive because they are able to utilize the bald-faced hornet nests not only for food, but also for shelter for their own cocoons and for their own larva. So it's interesting to see the larval stage of the parasitic wasp taken directly from the bald-faced hornet nest. This is what's left of the larva that was originally in that nest. Not much left of it. It was eaten pretty well by those other parasitic wasp larvae. Here in this cell is the same situation. The cocoons for the parasitic larva are deep down inside the nest. They're a lighter color, kind of like an orangish color. And if we pull that out, this is the whole cell, what the whole cell looks like. And inside there now is the cocoon structure of the parasitic wasps. And there's two or three of them in there clustered together. And they will look like the little one we just showed you. So you see there's one, two, three separate little cells in that cocoon structure, each of which holds the larva of a parasitic wasp. So that's what's inside a lot of these cells now are the parasites that took over the last of these pupating cells toward the end of the season. And they don't actually happen always at the end of the season. Sometimes these parasites will go right in there during an active nest and the bald-faced hornets don't even realize what's happening. They'll work right around the parasitic wasp that's attacking their own pupa. Sometimes what you'll find 
Here we have a bald-faced hornet pupa that did not survive. Save that as a specimen. Now let's take a look at this one on the end. It's like the same situation there. Partially developed pupating bald faced hornet. Not entirely clear what killed it, but for some reason it didn't survive. It's pretty likely that it was chewed on by some larva from a parasitic wasp, but it could have been other things that killed it. Weather, cold, what have you. Let's do the next one here. That one, the head came right off, but this is another pupating bald-faced hornet. Looks like it had developed pretty well. It's close to adult size, but somehow didn't survive. It may have been eaten from the inside by parasites or it may have just died from exposure or something else. All these cells that look wide open, those are the ones that survived as bald-faced pupa. Bald-faced hornet pupa will cut their silk cap all the way around the edge and come out normally. And you can see that process in a lot of our other videos. We have some very good footage of that process of the adult wasp chewing its way out after pupation and being born, if you will, on the nest. Uh, there's some pretty fascinating footage to take a look at if you want to see that on our other videos. Here's a pupating, very close to adult wasp. Unfortunately, this one didn't survive the pupation process. Looks like it got very close to adult, but did not survive. Now this one may have had a virus because the wings should have been more developed at this point, but they're not. And there is a virus that uh, is common in bees and wasps that shortens their wings. It stunts their wing development and eventually kills the wasp sometimes. And that, that may have happened here doesn't appear to be a very well-developed wing set on this wasp. Let's see the next one. Here's another one that did not reach adulthood. Here's another that looks like it was parasitized. This larva, this bald-faced hornet larva, the pupa, was attacked by parasites and eaten while it was inside the cell, like a couple of the others we've showed you. You can see the cocoons of the parasitic wasp inside the cell of the bald-faced hornet. So let's take that out and see if we can find any developing larva from the parasitic side of things. These are like the seed-like cocoons of the parasitic wasp. And 
And then down below, there's another cocoon-like structure inside the cell. Break that up, see what we can find. So if you look at a cross-section kind of of the cell, down at the bottom of the cell, there's a whole nother cocoon that was built by the parasitic wasp. Down at the bottom, that you can pull right out and look at. That's it for the top cone. Let's take a look now at the structure. Take a look at where they are connected. It's very tough material. We're gonna pull that off get access to what's below it. Let's take a look at some of the worker cells that for some reason did not finish pupation. Here's a worker. This would have been a female worker, but it didn't survive. Here's another one, female worker that didn't make it through pupation. Most of this nest hatched out pretty normally it looks like, but there's a few in here that didn't make it. Same thing there, a female worker that didn't get out of pupation properly before it died. Here's another. This one had a full set of wings. That one did pretty well. Almost fully developed, but didn't survive for some reason. Full set of wings. Take a look at a couple more here. Another one didn't survive pupation. Yeah, these are all partially developed pupa that didn't live. Interestingly, they, they look relatively well developed, so it's just not clear why they didn't survive, but something killed them. Weather, disease, parasites, who knows? Some debris on the end of the abdomen here. That could be some kind of parasitic activity. But otherwise it's pretty well developed and hadn't been eaten much.
Here's another cell that was parasitized. You can see down inside this cell that even though it had a silk cap like these, this one was actually parasitized and those open cocoons tell you that the parasitic wasp inside those ate the larva that was in here, the bald-faced larva, and then used, their, used that cell for its own development and then two or three of them were born in there and came out because their cells are open. So there's nobody home anymore now. They're all out. Looks like we just about explored most of the ones that were still there. Uh, here's the last one right here. Same story there. This one was parasitized and eaten, and it was eaten by parasitic wasps. So the larva that was in there became food for another species of wasp. So that's it for this nest. Let's take a look at the paper. So here's the paper of this nest. Here's looking Looking down from the top of the nest into the bottom where the hole would have been, the entry holes down here. If you turn it over, it would hang like this from the tree. And there you see the hole, the entries. So let's go through the layers of paper here. And we're going to preserve this paper. Very pretty paper greens and browns, tans, grays. Nice looking nest. You can see the layers here. And in these layers, you often find live organisms. So just be aware if you take these into your home, there's live organisms that can use these as their home for a couple of years at a time while they pupate. Like some of the parasitic wasps, they can take two or three years to hatch out. So if you bring one of these into your house, there's a possibility you have some campers that'll be a couple of years before they appear. Nice big sheets of paper on this nest. Take a look right here. Here's a perfect example of what we're talking about. This guy moved in after the bald-faced hornets moved out. And we'll have to figure out who he is. We'll do some research on whatever type of beastie this is. But that's an interesting looking... Looks like he's not quite ready for prime time, whoever he is. All right. How you doing, buddy? It's a pretty looking bug. It's beautiful browns and colors and patterns on that one. I don't know what species that is right now, but he's got a nice place to live for the winter, so he thought. So let's go ahead and keep that specimen. Put him in the jar for now, and we'll try to figure out who he is later. So here's one of our campers inside that nest. He was in the folded paper. And we'll do some research and let you know who that is in just a minute. So let's continue with the paper exploration. We're just going to separate each layer. I 
like the large sheets. See the size of that, it's quite large. A lot of pockets inside these sheets. Smaller nooks and crannies where living organisms can tuck themselves away for the winter. And some of them are just born in there through convenience. Another insect will lay eggs in there. pockety paper that's up around the top of the branch. So what we're doing here is we're filling up this bin with the paper. Each piece I pull off goes right in the bin and it'll be cleaned up and archived later. It's interesting to see how the paper is built right onto the existing leaves in the nest. The, the leaves in the branch of the tree, you see here how the paper is built right around it. It's interesting. The construction, this leaf goes through three layers of paper. This leaf goes through three layers of paper. One
Got a couple of sheets of paper on this nest. Love the look of that. So many colors in just such a small space. It's about an inch of space right here. And in that small space, you have beautiful greens, grays, browns, tans. Really nice. All right, that's it for this nest. So that was a nice looking nest. Two comb nest, one pretty large base comb, and then one secondary comb, probably reproductives. Let's move on to the next one. Just as a side note here, our local bees are out today. We ended up in the 50s today with sun, even though there was some rain forecasted. It's been very cool lately, but every now and then we'll get a day above 50 degrees. Whenever that happens, we Put out a little honey for our local bee friends, and here's some today. Despite the very breezy conditions, they're enjoying a little honey meal today. We always put honey in their feeder. This time of year, all the wasps, the wild wasps, are gone for the season here at the end of November, but the bees still exist and survive quite well throughout the winter. So whenever there's a warm enough day, they'll come out. All right, so the next one we're going to do today is this large one. It was a very good sized nest. Let's take a measurement on that guy. Let's see what we can find inside. All right, let's start with a measurement on this one. About 10 inches long, give or take. By about 10, so maybe 10 by 10. Maybe 10 by 10, 10 by 11. That's a pretty good size nest. On this nest, you can see the paper had already been degraded a little bit, but overall, it's in pretty good shape. There's a hole right here for the entry. So the back was attacked probably by animals or you know, it's possible it was damaged by something else. But uh, when it came down from the tree, it may also have been punctured a bit when we obtained it in the wild but there's a good entry hole right there and what you see inside are the combs on this nest and we'll take a look in there and see how many there are and if there's anything inside this nest that's still alive be it wasps or other insects so let's take a look at it we'll cut it open
Here we have a three or four layer nest, it looks like. Nice mature nest. Interesting secondary layers of paper in this nest where they actually wall off the various layers of comb. You don't always see that, but it's interesting when you do. I like the look of that. Let's take a look under the layer of paper that's separating the comb. of leaf material and actually maple seeds that they actually just built around and used as part of the paper of the nest. It's interesting, they just sort of include all of that material in the structure and support of the nest. There's still some green buds showing on these. What we're doing now is taking the top layer of paper off the nest. It hangs like this. Let's see if we can get a better shot of that. So it hangs like this, and the whole thing is covered in that layer of paper we just took off. The top is always very interesting to look at. It's very gnarled and pockety, and uh, it supports the whole nest hanging from the tree branch. And this one just has a ton of the maple material in there, or whatever type of tree this might be. And underneath that layer, you see the first layer of comb, always the toughest part of the nest. And here our third layer just finally fell off. But there you have the basic look of this one. And we'll take a look inside the cells on this nest to see what it has to tell us about how it developed. a collection of these these seed pods inside the top layer of that nest. All right, so let's take a look first at the third layer. These are usually the queen cells or the adult reproductive cells. If you compare them side by side, 
with some of the worker cells, you can see quite a difference in the size. And the reason for the larger size typically is you're going to put your reproductive queens in the later comb structures and you put your smaller female workers in the small ones. And those are done first because these are the workers that are born to help support the nest so the queen can focus on laying eggs. So for starters, we're going to look at the third comb. This is the most recent comb born to this nest. And we'll see what's inside it today. A lot of times when these pupating wasps don't survive, and you can see how tall they are, the pupating wasps, they build their own silk cap. They weave this silk cap through a gel-like substance that they have in their glands near their mouths. And it's mostly protein that creates the gel. And they weave their silk cap with that gel solution, line after line after line. And as soon as it hits the air, the oxygen, it hardens into silk. And that's how most silk is produced in the insect world, including the silk from silkworms. Uh, that we wear as clothing. It's a very strong material and these pupating wasps make a very strong silk. So let's take a look inside this one and see what happened here. Here as you can see this wasp was pretty well developed. It was uh, unable to finish the pupation process for some reason. We don't know why but yet anyway but it did not survive. So let's take a look at it. Its wings are developed. All of the parts it needs as an adult wasp are there. But for some reason, it did not survive. It may have been killed by cold weather or disease, or may, may have had parasites of some, some type. Hard to tell looking at it. Let's see the next one. Here's another partially developed pupating wasp looked like it got all the way to adulthood but for some reason did not continue with its development for some reason wasn't able to get out of the pupating cell These are good sized wasps that were probably queens or would have been queens had they survived. And their reproductives probably would have started their own colonies somewhere someday. You can see her mouth parts and her tongue structure. Good development on the wings. save her as a specimen. Here's another that's pretty well developed really, but for some reason did not survive. Looks like all these got 
out of their pupation stage okay. But this one on the end did not. Let's find out what's in there. This was a parasitized wasp pupa. What happened here is the pupating wasp was able to survive throughout pupation to the point where it was a larva weaving its silk cap. But while it was pupating under the silk cap, a parasitic insect, probably a parasitic wasp, laid an egg through the cap or through the bottom of the cell and put its own larva and egg, its own egg in there, which became a larva and fed on the bald-faced hornet larva. So that's why this one did not survive. Down in here you see the cocoon material for the parasitic wasp that did this. Or possibly another type of insect. I'm not sure if you can see that very well. But it's some type of parasitic insect inside that cell. And we're not sure what that was, but we're going to save it to study it. Clearly it's some sort of parasite that was born inside that cell, may have fed on the larva. So we'll keep that and we'll, we'll try to identify what this is under the microscope cam, get a species on it for you. This is the remains of a parasitoid wasp of some type that was found inside a cell on one of the bald-faced hornet nests. We're still trying to identify what this is. It's a little difficult with the head not present, so the head of this insect is not available for study. But the body and the wings indicate a parasitoid wasp. So if you can help us identify this, please leave it in the comments section of the video and we can share it with others. Here's the other side of the same insect. This is the back side. We'll try to show it to you here on the scope cam, give you a better look at it. No obvious color variations. It's all just kind of that same red tone. So let's go back into that one. Let's see if we can find anything else in there. Alright, so here's the next one. Let's take a look at that. Here we have another partially pupated wasp that did not survive the pupation stage. Looks like it may have been disease ridden, possibly eaten by parasites, hard to tell. It's a little stunted in its growth. And let's see, this would be one more here. There's another one that was pretty well developed overall, but for some reason just didn't survive. It's got good wing structure. It's a little small, like a worker. But did not get through pupation. The last one for this comb is here. This one never got very far along at all from the larval stage. See, it started to develop its exoskeleton, and then it seems to have been eaten, uh, which was probably parasite activity. The abdomen is chewed off. All right, let's take a look at the next comb structure.
Here's another partially developed worker, it looks like. It doesn't appear that it was able to develop its wings very well. This one didn't seem to develop to be quite right. Here's another. This one looks like a little worker. But it didn't uh, didn't quite develop enough to get out of the pupation stage. Here's one that was partially out. Looks like it might have been in the process of chewing its way out as an adult after pupating, but for some reason it wasn't able to complete the process. It's like a... Same here, another worker it looks like. Didn't develop all the way through pupation. Another one that got stunted and didn't survive pupation. Here's another very well developed pupation cell that was probably close to completion, but for some reason failed to complete. was a small worker just disintegrating in the cell. So this one was pretty well developed as well, but it just didn't survive pupation for some reason. Not clear what happened to it. There's two more. This one may have been eaten by parasites. Looks like maybe malformed or something.
There's another worker most likely. Pretty well developed, but it didn't survive pupation. Okay, so that looks like about it for the second comb. Let's take a look at the third comb, which is actually the first, if it were hanging in nature. You see it hanging like this from the top branch. So this would be the first comb, mostly workers born in here. And then this would be the second comb. And this one had the third comb originally. So that was a three comb nest. Pretty well matured. So let's take a look inside these cells. Same here. Another worker. seem to have been stopped in their cell development at about the same time. Maybe it was killed by weather, cold weather, or some type of disease. Each of these are similar in their development. They have stunted wings. It could be the wing virus. There's a particular virus that hits bees and some wasps possibly that are the virus causes poor wing development among other deformities. It's possible that's what's going on here. Underneath is hard to see that one but we'll try to get it. Yeah, this one uh, was pretty, pretty chewed up. Hard to tell if that was parasitized or if it was uh, killed by something else. left in there. All right, let's take a look at some others on the other side. I think there's one right here. Fairly well developed one, but didn't survive. This one developed pretty well with wings and full body, but didn't live through pupation. Get that one out. Uh, it's too hard to get to. All right, so there you have another pretty well developed nest, all things considered. 
Most of those were successfully pupating and got out alive, it looks like. It's always good to see when these nests thrive and make it through their full developmental stages. Bald-faced hornets are very beneficial to their native environment, which is North America. So you never want to poison these nests or remove them unless you absolutely have to. If they pose a danger to somebody, go ahead and remove them if you need to. But don't use poisons. There's no need for poisons. You can use vacuum extraction. You can use a relocation where you simply take the nest and put it somewhere else. There's many ways to do it where poison is simply not necessary. Ask for help if you need it. Do your research. Use protection if you're going to do it yourself. Um, these suits are recommended, that kind of thing. But, uh, it's always possible to help these nests survive. There's no reason to kill them off if you don't have to. And certainly, there's no reason to dump a bunch of poison into the environment just to kill a wasp nest. That's ridiculous. There's no need for that at all. So all you have to do is a green removal. And if you want to see how that's done, just look at our other videos. It's not complex. If you have proper protection and you do enough research, you can do it yourself. And you can relocate some of these nests so that they all have a chance to pupate out and get into the mating stage to propagate their species. And that's the bottom line. We want them to live. We want them to do well in the environment, in the ecosystem. They're great biological control agents. What that means is they help control a lot of other insect populations, pest insects in particular and some others. It's just important to understand that wasps belong in the environment and they should not be killed just because they exist. All right, let's move on and take a look at the paper from this nest. It's interesting this one had so many of the maple seed pods in it. Wasps will use whatever they find in the environments that they find themselves in to construct these nests. So you see a lot of leaves built right into the paper of the nest. And a lot of seed pods and a lot of sticks and twigs that uh, were on the twig that it was suspended from. They just learned to build around it. There's a lot of pockets and cavities in this part of the nest, this is the top of the nest, where it would hang onto the branch. So it's always very swirly, very pockety, compared to the smooth outer sheets, comparatively smooth outer sheets, larger sheets on the rest of the nest. What you have up on top is always a little bit more like this, um, kind of gnarled and pockety. And we often find insects hiding out in these pockets. So you gotta be careful of that if you're gonna bring them into your home or put them into some type of display arrangement. Go through all this stuff first. We'll see if we can find any living insects or parasites, that kind of thing, inside these paper layers. Sometimes you do. We find earwigs, spiders, parasitic insects, beetles, all sorts of different things. We found this guy today in another nest. Have to figure out who he is and we'll let you know after we research it.
pretty paper. I love all the leaves inside this nest. You see where they just built it? Right around the stem of the leaf. And they just keep going, it goes right inside. Really interesting construction. And all these seed pods built right into the paper. The inside of the nest, the inside of the paper. See how the leaves are built right into the paper? All the colors inside, browns and tans and grays. Some greens here and there. Spider webbing in here. Looks like some type of little spiders were inside. of paper all work around these stems, these plant stems. So you'll see that the, the stem of the leaf is built right through several layers of paper. It goes all the way in. So the paper was built around each one of these plant stems. Here's the last of the paper for this nest. So far I haven't found anybody living in here. Doesn't mean they're not there, we just haven't gone through every nook and cranny yet. But
right, let's move on to the next nest. All right, so the next nest today is this one. Medium-sized nest, still in pretty intact shape. We'll take a look at this guy measured out here. This one's about nine inches long by about nine wide. Just had a little honeybee visitor come take a look at some of our nests. The honeybees are out today because it's over 50 degrees. So we put a little honey out for them in our feeder. And we'll show you those guys later on in the video. But sometimes the bees will come around and just explore what's here. Okay, let's cut into this one see what we have here. It's like this one is a two comb structure, but the base comb is very thick. If there was a third comb, it no longer exists. It fell out of the nest or was pulled out. But this one's very well hatched out. Not very many failed pupa on this one at all, which is great. Hopefully most of these survived. Let's see what we can find in this nest. We'll look at the paper here in a minute. For now, we can just look at the outside. As always, beautiful paper. Social wasps make absolutely beautiful paper structures. They always remind me of Chinese lanterns. So we'll look at this paper in a minute. Now let's take a look and see what's left inside this nest. Start with the top comb. It was an eaten. That one looks like it was eaten by parasites probably. Let's take off the back paper first. See if we find anybody living in there. So you have the exposed back of the base comb would have hung like this upside down in the nest. This is the first comb built by the queen. This is where it attached to the tree that held it up. All this paper here, this stuff is always very tightly gnarled with a lot of little pockets and things in it. This is the paper that keeps the nest attached to the branch that it was suspended from. We found one deceased bald faced hornet. Maybe killed by the cold at the end of the season. So let's see if there's anything left in here. Here's one worker. You see that it was pulled out with the abdomen facing the outside of the hole. What happens there is 
and we see this fairly often, I'm not sure what this behavior is about, but for some reason, some wasps, when they come out of their cell, they're usually face up in the cell when they're developing. Then they chew their way out of the silk cap, and as soon as they come out, they find another cell and dive head first in there, and they stay there until they die. And it's unclear why that behavior is done. I'm not sure what causes that behavior, but uh, it happens often enough that it is worthy of note. Looks like something may have eaten the rest of this one, but uh, initially it survived all the way through pupation, then went back into a cell and never came back out. see any others like that right here. It's the remains of another that didn't survive. Went into the cell, didn't come back out. It survived pupation, then crawled into a cell head first and never came back out. And then something ate it from there. See if we can focus on that a little better. So this wasp survived pupation, made its way out of the cell, then went headfirst into another cell and stayed there. Then it was eaten by something else. Okay, let's take a look inside the cell here. Here's a partially pupated wasp that for some reason did not complete the pupation stage. Another one that's sort of disintegrating in the cell. It's a little worker, didn't survive. So that is a partially pupated wasp, but didn't survive. Same scenario here. Partially developed, didn't survive. Another pretty well developed worker, but it didn't survive pupation. Looks like about it. Most of these guys got out alive and did okay. So there's not many in here to explore forensically, which is always a good thing. We always want these nests to do well out in the native environment. Let's take a look at the paper. So here's the top of the nest, here's the bottom of the nest, the paper. That's where the hole was. So if you look inside, there's layer after layer of paper.
there is a deceased wasp. Little bald faced hornet. Windy today, I have to hold things down, it'll blow away. A few nice big sheets here. A lot of browns and tans in this one. Light grays, a little bit of green here and there. Pretty paper. Here's the swirling pattern that you see right around the hole of the nest. There's always this sort of pattern. See how the layers are constructed here. Check out those colors. Beautiful. Didn't find any other beasties in here. Just a couple of deceased bald-faced hornets. Looks like a pretty successful nest altogether. Let's go on to the next one. So here's the next one. This one was fairly small. Not sure if this piece came from this one or from another little one, but we'll take a look and see. We'll start with this one. This 
So this one, it looks like it was stunted somehow because there's only one comb or possibly the remnants of another. I think this might have been here. Most likely it fits right there. Yeah, that looks like that one. Okay, so on this nest, it was found in this condition in a relatively low height in a smaller tree. Paper on this one has a lot of tans in it, a lot of tans and browns, very pretty. This was the top of the nest. You can tell by all the gnarled pockety paper on it. Leaves are built right into it. So it started out as a pretty good healthy nest and obviously produced a fairly good number of viable adult wasps. So that's good, but for some reason it never got larger than this. And if we were to measure this thing, it's a little, little difficult for size because it was a little beat up when we got it. But uh, diameter on this is probably only about seven inches or so, give or take. Maybe seven by six-ish. So it definitely was smaller than some of them that we've seen this season in this area. So it looks like it was interrupted. Something interrupted it, and we're not sure what. Now, on the flip side of the cone, as you can see here, there is a hornet, bald-faced hornet, right here. And that makes me wonder if it was a queen that somehow died in the midst of building the nest, and therefore the nest didn't thrive, or if it was some other issue so it looks like the, this could be a queen and maybe she was in this nest and for some reason decided to stop building. Or this could be a hibernating queen. Let's take a look and see what we can find in here. See if we can get her out of there in one piece. So there's a couple of wasps in there. Could be they hunker down in there during cold weather. Here's another. So it looks like they may have taken shelter Here's another tucked away in a little pocket here. Didn't survive. So it's unclear what happened to these guys. They may have hunkered down in there to escape the weather, but ultimately they did not survive. Sometimes you find hibernating queens in here, so we'll be careful just in case. Now, this one is deceased. Looks like it may have crawled up in there and died, possibly from cold weather, it's hard to tell. But it doesn't seem to be eaten by anything. this was the top of the nest. Oh, there's one more right there. This was the top of the nest. This is the part that hangs from the twig of the tree that was suspending it. So it would hang like this. It looks like at least most of the ones that were in here were able to get out and survive because all of these are 
pretty healthy looking cells where the adult pupating wasp crawled out at the end of their pupation. They chew their way out of this silk cap and they probably did okay. Now, for the ones that did not survive, let's take a look at those. Looks like this one was a pupating wasp. It was probably eaten by parasites. This wasp just disintegrates when you touch it. Looks like it was a, would have been a worker had it lived. Hard to tell if it was parasite activity here or something else that killed it. This was going to be a worker, a female worker, but it didn't survive pupation. The stunted look of the abdomen, maybe it was parasitized, it's hard to tell. Now here's one that was clearly eaten by something. You see how small it is. Most of its body was eaten away by some other insect, probably parasitoid wasp. So if you look inside the cell, you see that there's cocoon in there. A normal cell looks like these. There's nothing in the bottom really, um, no structures at least. But if in a parasitized cell, you see down in the bottom of it is a cocoon-like material and that's from the parasitoid wasp, probably. Here you have the cocoon of whatever wasp parasitized that cell. And they have all hatched out, it looks like. So it looks like the parasitoid wasp also hatched out and survived. at the expense of the bald-faced hornet pupa that was inside that cell. Here's another that was parasitized, and you see down below it the same thing. So this was a viable bald-faced pupa that was eaten by the parasitoid wasp that then made a cocoon in the same cell. And when the larva hatched out, as adult parasitoid wasps, they took off, so they're gone now. That was it, most of them survived. So most of these are pretty normal hatch outs, it looks like. Here's one that didn't make it, probably also parasitized. This one was killed by parasites and eaten up. Yeah, nothing left in there but a little bit of that eaten up larva, the pupa. That was a little worker. Dropped that one, but it looked like a worker. And that's about it for this nest. So there you had a one level, one comb nest. Let's take a look at the paper. Happen to capture what looks like a little 
parasitic wasp. Not sure if it crawled out of one of these bins or if it landed there on its own because the weather was warm enough. But this sort of parasitic wasp preys on other insects and their larvae. So we'll try to get a species on this guy later. So here's the wasp underneath the scope cam. Give you a better idea what it looks like up close. It's black and yellow. It's got a yellow coloring on the face, yellow coloring on the underside of the abdomen and thorax, and some yellow markings on the backside of the thorax and the abdomen. Pretty wasp. Iridescent wings, long antenna. It's got amber colored legs mainly, except for the back hind legs are both orangey amber and black. Here's the back side of it on the scope cam. You can see the yellow markings on the upper thorax and the abdomen as well. So if you happen to know a species on this particular wasp, let us know. All we know so far based on the wing structure is that it's an ichneumonid wasp, which is a parasitoid wasp. These are known to parasitize the nests of other wasps like yellow jackets, bald-faced hornets, so most likely it crawled out of one of these nests. So these are the two ichneumonid wasps, the parasitoid wasps that we pulled from the bald-faced hornet nests. So here we have a sample container filled with bald-faced hornet specimens, and we're going to show you just a comparison of the size. Look how large the bald-faced hornets are compared to the small parasitoid wasps that were found inside the cells of their nests. So the parasitoid wasps, these we believe to be ichneumonid wasps, but we don't know the species. So if you happen to know the species on these, let us know in the comments. But uh, they were found parasitizing the nest of these larger bald-faced hornets. Here's the paper from that nest, that one comb nest. Let's see what we can find inside this. This is mostly what's left of this is mostly the top section of the nest because it's all that gnarly pockety paper that usually holds up the nest around the structure of the tree branch that it was suspended from. As the nest goes down toward the bottom, you'll notice it's much smoother, wider sheets of paper. But up at the top, it's always like this, very pockety. So there's not a lot of paper left on this one. But luckily, we got a little bit to look at. It's actually very pretty paper. I love the ones with the cream colors and brown. All right, let's take a look at our last one today. This was just a little one. This one was found in a tree that was only about 10 feet tall. It was a very young tree had been planted in a client's yard. Uh, this one, let's measure that guy. It's pretty tiny. It's about six inches by whatever's left of it is not much. Maybe maybe four, four by six or so. If you see inside, it looks like the nest had been started but then abandoned. You see here the beginnings of a bald-faced nest. And that's what's interesting about this one, as you can tell, see this small number of combs there. It was hanging like this from the tree. This is the bottom. And uh, the hole would have been about here somewhere. And it would have been hanging like this, here's the top. And if you look inside, the only combs that survived are these little ones. This is how the nest began. 
And these little cells are made by the queen and they're worker size cells. And they just expand and expand and expand until there's a larger and larger comb inside. And then they'll start adding secondary combs, third combs, fourth, whatever. So for some reason, this nest stopped in the middle of development. The queen either moved on or died or was killed by something. Um, it's possible that this one had been sprayed or treated, but I don't see any evidence of that. There's no residue, odor, nothing that makes it look like it had been spread. And the client said they hadn't touched it and hadn't even known it was there. We were actually looking at another nest on that property when we saw this one. So what's interesting about this nest is you get to see what the beginning of a nest would look like. Um, when the hornets are in there, they make these little tiny cells and that's what becomes the much larger ones that you saw in the other part of this video. So this little nest, for some reason, did not survive the very early stages of development. There's no sample of the leftover wasps that were in here because no comb, it appears no comb was ever formed. Or maybe if there was comb in here, it was uh, taken out by animals. You never know. But it looks like it just never formed. So it's a good example and a good specimen of a very early forming nest that was uh, stopped in the middle of the formation of the nest. So that is it for our forensic examination of five different nests today and one other in the first part of the series that we had and today we pulled these specimens out of these five nests. So what we'll do is take a closer look at them. So for size comparison, you can get a pretty good look at these. This would have been a queen. She's pretty big. You see the size on that one. Had it developed properly. This would have been a queen as well, probably. You see the body size on them is pretty large. Now these little ones were pupating workers. And by comparison, they're, they're much smaller. So if you look at the size of the workers, even as they got into pretty good developmental stages with wings, their bodies are actually a lot slimmer and smaller. So that gives you an idea of what was in these nests at the time that the nests died out. These were all pulled from pupating cells or were pulled from the nest paper or the surface of the nest. And then for live specimens inside the nest, in these five, we found this guy, some kind of beetle. We'll take a look and find out what that is after we research it. And we found this parasitic wasp this was probably inside one of the nests as a parasite. And then we found another insect that we haven't identified yet. And whatever that is, we'll try to figure that out as well. So at the end of the day, here's what we have from smallest to largest, stacked into containers These are each separate nests set up here for archival storage 
and further analysis later and for preservation particularly the paper bald-faced hornet nest Calico Vespula maculata, upstate Indiana. And in here, we have our sample specimens that came out of the nest. So that's it for part two of the two-part series, forensic analysis of half a dozen bald-faced hornet nests. We'll finish off this video with just a few minutes of footage of our local honeybees enjoying the honey feeder we set up for them. This was filmed on the same day we filmed the rest of these nests. And these guys, they kind of overwinter in a different way than wasps. In the wasp colonies, most of the wasps die at the end of the season due to old age and cold weather. Then the queens that are inseminated during the mating season overwinter by hibernating. And then they come out in the spring and they start new nests. Now bees, on the other hand, as you can see here, even though all the wasps are mostly dead for the season here in late November, the bees are still thriving. And they'll do this all winter long. Whenever it's warm enough to come out, if it's 50 degrees or higher, they'll come out and forage. And in the meantime, they just sort of hover around their queen and they ball up around the queen in the nest in their own hive. And that's how they survive the winters. So. We just thought we'd show you some of these guys while they're uh, harvesting honey to fuel up for the winter. Now the sun has gone down and it's getting cooler. We have one little camper still eating honey. Fueling up for a long winter. That's the last bee for the day. Thanks for being here. As always, we so much appreciate you folks who tune in and enjoy this content. We do a lot of long form like this for those who want to deep dive into the wasp world. And we'll be doing some shorter form stuff in the future as well. But we hope you had a good time and learned something today. Thanks again and have a good one.